fine? Cool. If I start getting too loud or too soft, just feel free to make a signal, wave at me, point up, and I'll increase or decrease the volume of my voice. Um, just wait for the last few people to filter in and then we'll get started. If you've, if you've come to learn a little bit more about this emotion of hate, um, did anyone feel a little bit uncomfortable with this title? Uh, yeah, me too. Don't worry. That's why I made it this way. Um, so we are actually going to be talking about this emotion of hate. Uh, we had a great Agile Coach Camp yesterday where we actually had two sessions where we spoke about emotions at work. Um, and it's nice to know that uh, here in India, it's the same as for myself back home in South Africa, as well as in Austria and in America, people don't always talk about emotions at work. Um, it's not a very commonplace thing, and it's always surprising when we do talk about it. Um, so I want to actually talk and broach the subject as seeing the power of negative emotions, um, how traditionally we kind of deflect them or don't really focus on them because they're seen as bad things. Um, and we want to just explore a little bit about what value you can get by just spending a bit of time looking at negative emotions and how you can use that to start achieving goals. Um, the nice thing with achieving goals, especially if you do them regularly, is that people take notice. You start identifying people which we might term as leaders because you see them as achieving some form of success. Um, before we get started, hate is, a, is, as I said, an uncomfortable topic for some, um, and it generally is associated with very, very, very deeply negative things. Um, I didn't find the code of conduct for agility today. Um, I know it must be somewhere I probably didn't look hard enough. Um, so I've shared a generic code of conduct, right? So when we talk about hate, we're talking about very specific things, certain instances in isolation, right? Um, we don't apply those to groups, right? So it's very important that uh, most code of conduct will specifically prohibit harassment or discrimination based on a person's race, sexual orientation, gender, etc. So um, due to the time frame, we've removed quite a lot of the exercises that we do if we have a longer format for this session. Um, so there's not going to be too much interactivity between you because it is a sensitive topic. So when we do a longer session, we will spend a little bit more time creating more safety around this topic. So I just want you to be aware of that. When you're thinking of hate, um, you're not thinking of a group of people, right? You're thinking of specific instances, and we'll talk about that. Um, we're going to be covering three main topics. So, well, two main topics, and then we're going to put it all together. Before we start speaking about emotion of hate, we need to understand what is hate. All right, so looking into the science behind the emotion, then we need to look into some of the science behind goals and motivation to achieve those goals. And then we're going to put it together, and I'm going to kind of bring it up into a conclusion. So that's me, uh, Bevan. I'm a coach and trainer from South Africa. I live in Cape Town. Um, I've chosen this photo specifically for the conference and in this talk um, because I'm generally seen as quite a happy, positive person. In fact, the first time I gave this talk at a conference, um, I was introduced by a very close friend of mine who said, I didn't even know that the word hate was in your vocabulary. Um, so it surprised a lot of people that I talk about this. Um, but the thought for this idea came from a lot of notes that I'd made about uh, what is it that gets people to be successful? Right? And I thought at first I'd be able to put this awesome motivational speech together that was inspiring. And instead, I kept coming back to all these negative things, these negative thoughts and feelings. And about a few, few years ago, I think it was about three years ago now, um, I realized that a lot of the success I'd reached in my own career um, stemmed from hatred. Um, just a quick show of hands. Who's heard of um, someone saying that you need to find your passion in life to be successful? All right, he's something along those lines, right? How many of you, you can keep your hands up. Keep your hand up if you have found your passion. Keep your hand up if that same passion was what you thought maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, this, this little hand up. Keep your hand up if it's what you thought you were going to do when you were a child. All right, yeah, not many of us have that, right? So passions change, right? So for me personally, I had no idea, right? My passion was not being you know, homeless on the side of the street. I got into my career specifically to earn money, right? Um, and it was hard. I, I, I reached success, right? I did well in what I did, but I never felt driven. I struggled to find this passion that people spoke about in leadership. Um, 
So that was my story. I started off as an engineer and I did it, I did well, but I could never find this thing that people spoke about, this passion, all right? You know, whenever I said, oh, well, passionate about not being homeless, people thought I was joking, and that was honestly what I felt. So um, what I did see was that a lot of conversations that people have, and some of you might relate to this, would be getting together with friends, or as Mike said, you know, just talking about our problems is very easy, right? Um, has anyone ever used the site as, oh, I hate Jira? Right? Or, oh, I hate being micromanaged. Right? Um, a lot of times we just kind of stop there. And the running advice is, you know, if you don't like something, move. Right? Change. You're not a building, you can change. And that's what we do. We react to negative circumstances. We don't like Jira, what do we do? We go and use Trello. Right? A few months later, we don't like Trello, what do we do then? We move to Basecamp or something else. Right? Um, if we hate the way that we feel in our job, what do we do? We find a new job, right? And if we hate something there again, we move to something else. So if we don't spend the time to actually dig into what are the needs that aren't being met, a lot of the time we're just going to repeat the same behaviors that drive us to feeling that level of frustration. So I want to introduce something. Has anyone done a journey line exercise before? Yeah, so I just want to introduce. So this is my journey line. Um, from around late 2008 is kind of when I started uh, working professionally. And you can see I went through a few dips. So on the Y scale, we've got positive experience and then negative experience and then across time. So you'll see as time goes by, I started my career, really happy, I got my job, I was loving what I was doing. Um, and then I started being micromanaged and working in a waterfall way. I, I hated it, so what did I do? I went to another company. And as I went to another company, I learned more about Agile. And then Scrum was enforced on me, um, which is, I think a lot of people are laughing because you've experienced that yourself, right? You will do Scrum. Don't care about values and principles. You have to do a daily stand-up, right? And give us status updates. Um, and you have to build software that would normally take three months in two week iterations, right? That's the expectation. Um, and again, we, we try to react away from that. So what do we do? Well, I'm not gonna do Scrum. I'm gonna do Kanban, right? And eventually that just kind of cycles up and down. And then, like I said, about three years or so ago, I started realizing that negative things happen, but the response to those negative things uh, can change. We know that if we've got a long-term vision, there will be steps back as long as we're taking two more steps forward. So that's what we're trying to get to today. We first need to understand a little bit about hate. Is this hate? What does it look like to you? Does it look like hate? No? Some of you, yes, yeah, some of you know. What about that? Hate, yeah, it's just a bit of a, what about this? Yeah, maybe, yeah, n maybe not, right? So, yeah, I tricked you. <laughs> so, um, the interesting with hate, and why some of you were nodding and some of you were shaking your head, is that there is no fingerprint for emotions, right? How many times have you felt absolutely sad inside, and someone asks you, how are you doing? And you smile and you say, I'm fine. Yeah? So the way that we look, it's not something that can relate directly to how someone's feeling. Right? So we don't know exactly what hate looks like because each individual has their own experience. Um, and what you realize when you dive into the science is that there are two major theories into emotions. There's the classic view of emotions where emotions are inherent. They're instinct. Right? So um, in fact, Paul Ekman has probably the most research on this. Um, and some of those photos are actually from his research paper, um, where basically they try to identify seven core emotions of human beings. Yeah. The opposite of that is this, the theory of constructed emotion, and it ties into the theory of constructed reality. Um, our brains as human beings are a lot more efficient than what we make it out to be. If you look at an animal, so the classical emotion theory likes to talk about the triune brain, you know, you've got the lizard brain, you've got the you know, monkey brain, and then you've got this all amazing human brain. In reality, it's not really like that. When we think about constructed emotions, we, we, we want to break away from this idea that we, have, we are born with emotions, right? We're born with feelings, right? And it sounds like I'm being pedantic on the English, um, but there's a difference. When you see an infant crying, right? Do you immediately point to the infant and say, stop being sad? 
generally as a parent you'd ask it a whole bunch of questions. Are you sad? Are you angry? Are you hot? Are you cold? Are you hungry? We don't know, right? So what happens is for our brains to conserve energy, um, it doesn't actually remember anything. It remembers pieces of things and creates a construction of what it needs to you know, access at that time. So it's almost like a prediction. Does anyone here do machine learning or data Linux? It's exactly a neural network. Right? So neural networks actually explain the constructed theory of, 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 of emotion. We identify certain things from our inputs, right? So what are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we smelling, feeling, tasting? Uh, what's happening inside our body? And then based on previous experience and social construction, in other words, what our parents taught us and our social circles taught us, we give it a name. Right? And that's the beauty and the power of being human. We give things name and it has power. The example that Mike used was an organization. Right? An organization doesn't physically exist, but it exists to all of us because we've created that and that's an acceptable social construct. I'll give you an example. Who here loves going on roller coasters? Who absolutely hates going on roller coasters? Right? So I'm going to talk this through. So normally this would be an exercise, but I'm going to talk it through. Whenever you speak to people that love roller coasters, you ask them about what, what is going on inside you when you're about to go on a roller coaster? Like, what are some things? Maybe let's just pop up some answers. What goes on inside you? Excitement. So those are emotion words. What's going on? What's happening inside your body? Is your heart beating faster? Yeah. Right? Do you sometimes feel a funny feeling in your neck? Does your face get warm? Do you like maybe tremble a little bit? Switch it around. The people that hate roller coasters. Does that sound very similar? Yeah. Right? So from an emotional point of view, from a feelings point of view, we have similar things happening inside us. Right? And what that means is that somewhere in your past, you've made an association with roller coasters as a fearful thing or roller coasters as an exciting thing. Right? So it just shows you that even as human beings, we feel certain things, but based on our own upbringing, we can actually create different responses to it and create different names to it. So fear or excitement. Right? So it's just a, a very light example into it. There's a book that explains it really, really well. If you like reading research papers, <laughs> So this is a book written by Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. Um, it's called How Emotions Are Made. She's an incredibly smart woman. Um, so she heads up a, a lab at Harvard University into emotions. And that's all they study. And the book is quite a heavy read because it references a lot of paper. I think a third of the book is actually just reference papers and notes. Um, but it explains quite nicely with a lot of analogies and a lot of examples of what this theory of the social constructed reality is, as well as the theory of emotions and how it relates. Um, they're both theories, so there's evidence supporting both of them, but it, in true science, it's good to hold up both views and try to kind of see which conclusions um, fit the right facts. Right? Um, so, I'd like you to take some time and just kind of at your paper, so I'm gonna give you a few minutes to do this, I want you to draw a journey line for yourself. So remember, you want to draw positive, negative access and time. And just for yourself, so you don't have to share this with anyone else, just draw your own journey lines. And in your negative spaces, so where you go into the negative, I'd like you to think about what are the feelings that were going on for you. And using clean language, so I'm not going to dive into the depths of clean language, but I do recommend there's a bunch of books on this picture that are excellent. In fact, one of the speakers is here, Marion Way is here. So you can actually go and chat to her a little bit. I know I'm going to. Um, and these are just some questions that you can ask yourself. So as an example, I hate a Jira. So when I hate Jira, it's like what? Right, so for me, it was like I felt compressed. Right? I felt like I was being pushed into a little tight ball. Right? I had all these thoughts and feelings, but it was pushing me into a little you know, ball. And it says, well, what kind of ball is that? Well, you know, it's this like metal ball. It doesn't really move. It doesn't have space for me to adjust. And you can kind of read through those questions, trying to explore it a little bit more, right? So 
take a couple of minutes and just think individually for yourself, draw your journey line and identify those negative points. Once you've identified those, take some time to ask yourself those questions in your head and try to get a metaphor for what this hate looks like. And then we'll talk about it after that. I'm going to give you about two, three minutes for that. Okay, so why do we do this? So there's a um, field of research called the transmutation of emotions. And what it tries to do is it tries to speak about how do we take negative emotions and turn them into something positive. So not just trying to discount the negative emotion, but really try to change that emotion into something positive. Right? Uh, and one of the most the leading theories or leading models that one uses is something called the subject object model right if you see your emotions as an object which is kind of what this creating of a metaphor is it allows us to transmute it so change it acknowledge it turn it around move it and i'm going to give you an example if you were wearing glasses that had rose tinted lenses in them everything you see would be a rose tinted or like rose colored. If you remove those lenses, you would see things in a different light, you would see things differently. And that's kind of what's happening with your emotions. Your emotions are not you, they're not, you know, the reality. It's what we're using to look through, right? So once you realize that emotions are something that you can, you know, pick up, move around and acknowledge that they're there, it allows you to have a little bit more control into moving them. So the reason we look at the theory of constructed emotions is that if we understand that they are constructed, in other words, something that is built up of a bunch of inputs and we've created an output, um, it means that we can change it. We have the power to change it and control it, right? Very important, this is not easy. Yeah, if it was so easy, we'd all be you know, switching our emotions on and off and changing things. It's really not. What it's meant to do is I want to inspire you to just kind of Think about that. The next time you feel an emotion, it's a lot easier to do with a positive emotion. So there's a, a top tip. Um, look into what's going on inside you. What are you actually feeling in your body? What is happening around you? What context is there? Why have you given the name to that emotion? If you're feeling happy, what is happy? Why, why does it feel happy, right? The next time you're in a negative um, space or feeling a negative emotion, try to do the same thing. Um, in that way, it allows us to learn a little bit more about how we've come to this naming of emotions. It allows you a little bit more power into what's causing it, is what's triggered it. Why do I feel this way? And that leads us into the next one is goals and motivation. So there's a very specific part of goals and motivation that I want to focus on, and it's something called self-determination theory. 
So has anyone here read the book uh, Drive by Daniel Pink? Yeah, some people. So he talks about individual motivation and autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Right? So um, it's a great book, and he's a great speaker. And a lot of the work that he did was came from research done by um, Edward Desi and, and Richard Ryan. Right? So one of the things that they came out with was that, and, and I quoted it straight from the paper, is fluctuations in need, in need satisfaction, will directly predict fluctuations in well-being. Right? So it's a paper, so they had to use really fancy English. But what it means for us is that when our needs are not being met, it directly correlates into our well-being not being healthy. Right? So when we think about all those inputs that we have where it triggers us to name an emotion, um, a lot of the times some need within us is not being met. So we need to focus on not so much what is the, you know, what is the direct or what is the obvious cause of this negative emotion so that we don't just react to it, is to identify what that inherent need is so that we can respond to it. Yeah? Um, so they talk about three um, levels of motivation or basic psychological needs. Autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So autonomy is the ability to be self-directed, to choose your own path. Competence, yeah? Um, there's a lot of controversy in Agile about certifications, right? In fact, in the coach camp yesterday, there was another talk about certifications. Um, I'm very pro-certification, yeah? I never used to be, but when you apply it to a need for competence, if that's what the person needs to feel competent to do the job, then good for them, right? So people have different relationships. Some people are completely fine and feel stable in their competence without a certification. Some people do need it, right? So you see there's a psychological need. And finally, it's relatedness. We've come to a conference so we can relate to others. Um, Mike spoke about how easy it is to speak about our problems. You know, I spoke about earlier how easy it is for us to talk about, oh, I just hate these things. Why? It's just relatedness. We want to build connection to, to people. Knowing that, we can talk about levels of motivation. So it's all good and well having a goal and setting goals, but there are different levels of goals. You get some goals that are better than others, right? Not because they're compared to other people, but compared to yourself, there's a higher probability of you continuing to achieve your goal based on the amount of motivation um, that exists behind that goal. So we split it into two quadrants. There's external regulation and internal regulation, or external goals and internal ones. And I'm going to use an example of an agile transformation. Right, so that seems to be a common theme that happens here. There's a lot of agile transformations. External regulation would be setting a goal like, if the whole department goes agile, you will get a 10% bonus. So if you as an agile coach or consultant are responsible for that and you see a bonus, that's external regulation. What happens if you don't get your, your goal? What happens then? Well, then you move into introspection. Right? So this is where a lot of people sit. They say, if I can't get our organization or this organization to be agile, then I'm a bad coach. Right? Or I'm a terrible scrum master. Or I'm a bad project manager. How many people do we know that sit in this space? Right? Um, when we move towards identification, this is where we start looking at goals and identifying value in it. Right? I want to go agile. Right? Not for the rewards or because you know, I'm worried about myself. I want to go agile because I really like the way that it empowers people to take ownership of their work. Already you can feel that the language is becoming a little bit more focused on outcomes. The most powerful form of goals that one can set is integration. And that's where we actually integrate the goals with our internal value system. Right? I want to go agile. I want to use agile. I'm pro-agile because it values individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And I value being able to have strong connections with the people I work with and make sure that I'm meeting their needs. Uh, so if that is your goal, no matter how many positive and negative things happen to you on that journey, you're more motivated to achieve those goals because that becomes part of who you are. In fact, once we align our goals and needs and values, we can set ones that, are inherently, that we're inherently motivated to achieve. Yeah? And this is what passion is. Yeah? So when you hear people talking about passion, it's because they can generally describe something that ties into their value system. 
Yeah, so I always say um, my value or my goal is that I set out to achieve environments where people do their best work. All right, so nowadays when people ask me, why are you an Agile? Why are you an Agile coach? I say, well, my goal in life is to create environments where people do their best work. And Agile right now is, has proven um, a value system and principle system that allows me to get that. It's a body that allows me to achieve that. Right? Again, first line of the manifesto, we're uncovering better ways. I assume something better will come along one day or more practices and tools will be uncovered that allows me to create that value. Right? And I didn't know that three years ago. Three years ago, um, I just knew I hated working in a waterfall way. I hated being micromanaged. I hated the fact that um, I went to university and I studied to solve problems, but then someone would give me a document that had solved that problem and I had to implement it, right? even if I disagreed with it. Right? So identifying those things was actually what I needed was I didn't want to go agile. I actually just wanted to be happy at work and be productive at work and find value in work. And that's what's driving me to go forward. So let's put that together. Um, if I go back to the journey line, um, when I was reacting to the hate, the long hair, I would always, almost, almost always fall back into this pattern. Right? So if I do this in a workshop level, I actually take part and I take a flip chart and I'll draw my accurate one out. And you'll notice there's a lot of ups and downs. What started happening once I identified what my passion was is that there's still ups and downs, but they generally stay positive. Because what you're doing is you're starting to see what the next step is. I still feel the emotions of hate. There's still so many things that I hate, especially if when you go to agile conferences and you have conversations for, with people, you start relating on the fact that we all hate certain things. The difference is, is that I know that there's a bigger goal. I, this is just another need that I need to figure out. What is it that I'm missing? What do I need to change? What experiment can I try to resolve this? So wrapping up, what is hate? So hate is a constructed emotion that we can identify, acknowledge it, and we can transform it. Right? So we don't want to just neglect it or th chalk it up to frustration. Goals and motivation is that we're most motivated to achieve our goals that satisfy our psychological needs. Um, when, when we have goals that inspire us, that we can think about or even not think about, we will always find ways of achieving those goals. And finally, it's good to realize that hate is a signal. Um, and when our needs aren't being met, that signal gets more and more positive or more negative, excuse me. It becomes more negative. We become more frustrated. And if we don't identify with that, it's just going to keep happening, right? We don't want to avoid it. Um, and we can use it to identify that what need it is and how we can transform that. In fact, the conclusion I came with up was uh, when we dismiss hate in a reactionary way and we discount those feelings um, as just frustration, we risk the opportunity to look deeper into ourselves and at our inherent psychological needs. Right? So we, we actually lose a lot of value in doing that. We try to stop feeling rather than meeting the need. Right? So it's very important we don't avoid negative emotions. We kind of acknowledge them and realize what it is. So it's not about just speaking in the problem space, it's identifying that this problem exists so we can acknowledge it and realize what are the needs that we actually want. So how do we take a negative emotion, focus on the positive, because that's going to pull us forward. And that kind of brings us to questions. So it's a lot of information, less exercises to fit in the time space. What are the questions that are coming up for you? Golden circle. Sorry. Yeah. I got scared. Sorry. So um, I see a lot of alignment uh, between what Simon Sinek says in terms of the golden circle, start with why and then yeah. how and then what. So um, what are your thoughts on that? How much aligned this theory is mm -hmm. to what Simon Sinek um, has yeah. written? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, it aligns quite a lot. Yeah. Um, before we can determine what it is that we want to do, you know, and how we're going to do it, it's important for us to realize why we're doing it in the first place. Um, so it, relating back to my own examples was, um, as an engineer, I felt almost directionless. So you know, you feel, I started as an engineer, I was like, what's the goal? Well, 
you know, senior engineer, manager, maybe architect or CTO, you know, that's kind of the path that's laid out for you, right? It's what, what is it that you're going to do? How are you going to do it? I don't know, work hard, I guess. Um, and only when I really found out why Agile resonated with me so much, um, I realized that it's, it's broader than that. What it is, Agile is a what, right? Um, Scrum is a how, you know, daily stand-ups is a how. Um, in fact, if you're interested, there's a model called the spine model that uh, talks very deeply into this aspect and it's very similar. Before you start with practices and tools, you first need to identify needs. Um, from those needs, we then find values and principles that align to those needs before we find practices and tools. So your practices and tools need to align to principles, values, and needs for them to be effective. Right? So um, again, re referencing Mike's talk, it's the same as when we understand the outcomes and the needs that we're trying to achieve, there's different frameworks and approaches that we can, and practices we can use to achieve that. But if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, the what and the how becomes rudderless that way. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Over that way. So uh, it's a question plus perspective both. Uh, I, I kind of I was looking at it as hate being an extreme form of something that you don't like. Yeah. Uh, how how do you kind of differentiate? that now I'm at a stage where I don't like something, mm -hmm. uh, is it a good time to start taking action in the same model? Mm -hmm. Or do I wait for it to become as extreme as hate and mm -hmm. then say, okay, now yeah. this kind of applies. So it's more of a combination of how you're able to control your uh, emotions in that fashion as well. Thank you, that's a, that's a very great question. Um, so to answer that, um, I chose hate as being exactly that, the most extreme form of dislike. Right? So there's a bit of controversy in the name, right? So I'm not going to be, hit, I'll be transparent about that. Um, but it is, how do we differentiate between hate and dislike? So in the longer format of this, we do an exercise um, called affect mapping, right? So the scientific term for emotion or thing is affect, so A-F-F-E-C-T. And what we do is that emotions can be plotted on a quadrant graph, right? So on the vertical axis, we'll have high energy and low energy, and on the vertical axis, will have um, negative feeling and positive feeling. Right? And part of the exercise, we'll say, let's say something trivial that you hate. Right? So I'm gonna give an example. Someone hates ice cream. Right? Some, most people don't, but some people do. Where would that fit in that quadrant? Right? Is it a high energy hate? Like, are you shouting, are you screaming? No, it's probably low energy, um, but it's a dislike. Right? So emotions, because they're constructed, means that we can apply names to different feelings. So what they do as part of these research is that they map affect of a group of people here, and then they say, what would you call that? And different people, based on different cultures, different upbringing, different regions in areas where they grow up, will have slightly different names. Right? So what is useful is increasing your granularity or your vocabulary. So how many emotions do you know? and can you map them so that you can relate to other people. So the best way to understand what someone is feeling is to talk about what they're actually feeling, so without the name of the emotion. And that kind of aligns on there. So this could be used for any emotion, any negative emotion. So whether it's dislike or whether it's hate. If you're waiting until it gets to hate and then trying to resolve it, it's probably gonna be more reactionary than dealing with it. So a lot of what I did here was retrospectively, identifying after the fact. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, we'll, we'll have one more question. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Bevin, at the outset, uh, compliments to you for choosing a very relevant topic, Thank you. Uh, which is connected to the emotions. Mm -hmm. I just want to draw the attention of yours uh, regarding the ancient Indian teachings uh, written some 5,000 years back and uh, they had uh, always uh, propagated for a hate-free society unfortunately which is not happening across the globe. Yeah. So if we uh, have we forgotten our ancient uh, values and other things uh, and uh, as you said that uh, hate is a constructed uh, uh, and it can be identified and transformed. Mm. But uh, I mean as the saying goes uh, if, if someone is sleeping you can wake him up, but uh, if he is pretending to sleep, how you can? Mm -hmm. And uh, since you are from South Africa, yeah, I mean there is no need to tell 
if it is a deliberate hit mm -hmm. of a kind of any any discrimination or something like that absolutely so you have gone through the history of south africa yeah so uh, i'm actually i've actually been affected by the history of apartheid of south africa so um i i'm not in the previously privileged group of South Africa. So I actually grew up in a non-white area because of apartheid. But that's kind of why we did the disclaimer at the beginning. The hate for a group is, is not really hate. Right? We call it hate because it's a good definition that everyone can understand about discrimination against a large group of people. Right? And in the world, there's a lot of that suffering caused by hates of large groups of people. And the reason we stray away from that is because you don't know all people. Right? So, from a scientific point of view, hating all people is illogical. Right? But behind that hatred, there is a need. Right? And again, I would encourage at an individual level, don't do this in groups, at an individual level, if you've felt hatred for another group of people, acknowledge that. It's you're a human being. Right? We're all in, influenced by our society around us. And try to understand what is the need of yours that's not being met by this other group. What is the need that's causing you to have a strong emotion? Are you actually feeling something inside? So is your heart beating faster? You know, what's happening to your breathing rate? Uh, can you feel your muscles tighten? Can you feel a, light, a lightness in your head or a tightness in your chest? Like what is actually going on for you inside to, to call it a hatred of a group? Right? And that's kind of the discussion, right? If we don't talk about it, if we don't deal with what's happening internally, it probably will never change. Right. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Cool. Uh, we are done with the time. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So yeah, the session was very engaging, and the topic was highly relevant. So cool. the small token of gift from us. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks. You want to take a photo? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, Ashish. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your time. If you do have any more questions or feedback, uh, you're welcome to find me outside. I'll be around for the next two days. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vivian. All right. Uh, so, guys, we are bang on time for lunch. We can do uh, networking with all the speakers and the group around, and we can continue with our lunch for. Yeah. Thank you.